Hey everybody, thanks for coming out today. Uh, my name is Adam Leach. I am a professional hobo nickel carver, whatever that means. I guess it just means that I'm able to trick people into paying me more for these coins than I paid for them. So, uh, just to get started, uh, raise your hand if you know what a hobo nickel is. Got one, two, three, four. That's the best best turnout all day. This is awesome. Uh, hey, uh, how many knew before they got here? <laughs> uh, well, lo long story short, uh, a hobo nickel is a uh, nickel, uh, usually an Indian head, but not always, that somebody came along and, and started messing with. So uh, whether they carved it, hammered it, punched it, um, it doesn't really matter what they did is they, they changed the image and it's not an Indian anymore. So um, most hobo nickels get turned into a hobo a guy with a hat and a beard. Um, not a lot of creativity, but you'll see really fantastic ones and really crude ones, and you go, oh, there's a hobo nickel. Uh, in the modern day, a hobo nickel can mean a lot more than that. Uh, any coin that's been manipulated or sculpted in a three-dimensional way uh, gets lumped into the term hobo nickel. So if it's a dollar, it's still a hobo nickel, but it's also a hobo dollar. So. Um, there's also a, a branch of coin manipulation or defacing called love tokens, which is a historically older tradition dating back to the late 17th century, 1600s. And that's going to be usually a gold or a silver coin that was machined flat on one side and then engraved, uh, usually a monogram, a name, a date, um, maybe a simple image, but almost always a flat coin with just lines engraved. Um, something beautiful happened in 1913. Uh, the US government um, issued a coin that, that uh, we call the buffalo nickel or an Indian head nickel. Um, at the time it was the new nickel and it was a really big deal and um, almost immediately after they minted them somebody messed one up and, and somebody else saw it and said I could do that and we don't know who did it. Uh, we don't know if it was a hobo, if it was a jeweler or an engraver it could have been a GI, uh, you know, about to get shipped off to World War I, and he was sitting in the barracks and he noticed, oh, I, I could carve something into that. Um, so uh, a lot of the, the early history of Hobo Nichols is kind of obscure and, and unknown and gets filled in with your imagination. And, and your imagination can really run away and play tricks with you uh, when you find an old coin that somebody carved up and uh, you know you might find uh, the donkey turned into a, or the buffalo turned into a donkey or a mule or a, a horse or um, you might find him turned into a little guy sitting on the john taking a crap so <laughs> it's a lot of fun um, but but you find a coin and you don't know who carved it you don't know where they carved it you don't know why they carved it and you have to start doing doing a little Sherlock Holmes stuff and, and trying to figure it out. And uh, now, um, 2013, 100 years later, there's people finally starting to try and figure this stuff out. So uh, the Hobo Nickel Society is a, a collector's group that has spent years and, and countless uh, hours poring over every coin ever carved trying to figure out who carved it and oh well it, it you know came up to auction here well who sold it and you go oh they, they they bought it at an estate sale well who's estate let's try and find the the surviving family members and ask hey did your grandpa joe have a real weird coin well do you know where he got it and um what we've been able to piece together is that um uh, Hobos carved them, prisoners, convicts, some were carved behind bars. They were carved by jewelers, by engravers, by apprentices, uh, metal workers, machinists. Uh, anybody who had a little bit of time and a nickel in their pocket. Um, it's nice to think, you know, oh, a nickel, you know, no big deal. But, but in 1913, a nickel was a, a decent amount of money. Uh, in today's terms, anywhere from uh, 15 to 20 bucks. You know, you could, you could buy um, 
a good meal, a night in a hotel, uh, uh, um, you know, a new jacket. So, so to carve the nickel in 1913 uh, definitely took a, a leap of faith that, that you were going to get more than a nickel for it. But at the same time, um, you carve a nickel and sell it for a dime, that's profit. And, and if a nickel is, you know, in today's terms, 20 bucks, and you turn 20 bucks into 40 bucks in a couple of hours, you're, you've got a good thing going. So just, just by deduction, uh, in my mind, I believe that all hobo nickels across the board were carved for the same reason, entertainment and profit. You're bored, you're gonna do something, you wanna keep your hands busy, so you carve a nickel into a hobo, and then your buddy goes, that's cool, man, what do you want for that? And then you're hooked instantly. The first time that happens, you, you carve a nickel and somebody goes, what do you want for that? You, you're gonna keep carving for the rest of your life. So um, at some point, somebody carved one, their buddy said, that's cool, I wanna do that. And a small group of people, uh, I think limited under a under thousand probably in history. We have no way to know, uh, but uh, there was never a point that hobo nickels were popular or a part of mainstream culture. It's just, it's never happened. In fact, now I think is, is the greatest chance for hobo nickels to become uh, a household word. You know, uh, the internet has really opened up the market. Uh, it's opened it up to a, a global, global market and um, there are carvers in, in almost every major country. Uh, a couple of guys in Spain carving right now, a couple of guys in England, there's a couple of guys down in the Philippines, um, a handful of Canadian guys just started this year and um, it's amazing. These guys all over the world can carve their coins, put them on eBay, and other people all over the world can buy them. So it's exciting because it, here's this hundred year old folk art tradition that 90% of the people in the world have never even heard of and it's just this this wide open field ready for people uh, with any degree of talent to, to get involved you can um, you know these guys here you could sit them down for a half an hour with a nail and a hammer and uh, I guarantee anybody in the family will give you five bucks for any nickel you make and uh, you drop that in your college fund and you're, you're on the way and uh, and that's the beauty of it there's there's a, a market for a five dollar hobo nickel there's a market for a five thousand dollar hobo nickel so um and, and the, the ladder rungs are real easy to climb you know <laughs> you start just making these ugly coins and giving them to your friends and after a year you've got a little little small business and uh there's no wrong way to do it. That's the beautiful thing. If you have a, an idea that you go, well, I wonder what that would look like, and you take a nickel and you whack at it or grind it or scrape it, and you go, oh, that didn't work. Well, you still have your nickel. You're not out even a penny. You can still, you know, you just mix it in with the rest of your change and uh, no harm, no foul. You don't even have to admit that you did it. You know, don't tell anybody. Uh, but if it looks good, you did it right and that's that's the neat thing is uh is that that's your your uh, final barometer on on whether you did it or not is oh i like it you did it right and, uh, so um speaking of doing it right how do you make a hobo nickel um the first part for hardest part out of all of it is holding your nickel still. I don't recommend holding it in your hand. <laughs> your teeth don't work. So um, in 1912, I don't know who invented it, but uh, on April 9th, 1912, somebody patented this thing called a jeweler's vice or an engraver's ball. And that was a brilliant thing. Until then, they used a shellac which is kind of what I did when I first learned how to carve hobo nickels. Um, and it's basically uh, like a hot glue. It, it's hard when it's uh, cool, but you heat it up and it gets sticky and, and gooey. And so for a long time, I just glue my nickel onto a piece of wood and carve it just like it. you'd be whittling a stick. You know, you got a hillbilly standing out in the field and not just stand out in the field and, and carve like this and and that right there is all you need to get started uh, this tool is called a graver g-r-a-v-e-r -E you can get them off of ebay for a couple of bucks you have to put your own handle on it it's a little complicated but it's not that big of a deal um, or 
everybody's got a garage you know grandpa's got a bunch of broken drill bits and a, a belt sander and you can make this just out of any piece of steel in your garage you can make this shape the important thing is your cutting surface is a 45 degree angle it's pretty much the easiest angle to remember so you're good to go uh, if it cuts the metal or makes a mark it works keep doing it the experiment um, and it's a, a lot of fun once you've carved for a while and you're like this is great I want to keep doing it then you can start buying all these other expensive toys uh, which um, I would suggest first and foremost if you're getting into it, anything to help you see the coin better is awesome this is called an optivizer and you can get them for 20 to 60 bucks buy the $60 one it's worth it you're, they're your eyes if it's bad it makes your brain hurt and you're gonna stop carving and you'll give up so sink a little bit of money into that uh, after that a stereo microscope is just it changes your whole world it, it turns the the surface of the coin from approximately half an inch to as big as your room so uh, you can zoom in um, actually on the screen here I've got this coin and uh, I'll try and get a little better focus on it. <clears throat> this uh, would probably be, well, you know, on the wall is a few thousand times, but through the microscope, I can see it at four and a half times bigger. So it, it looks like I'm carving a silver dollar. And when I zoom in all the way, I can have the entire screen be just his earlobe and so overkill that it doesn't even matter. I could carve for five hours and then look at it and go, oh, I can't even see what I did. What is... So, um, but this, uh, you know, you're going to sink a, another 500 to a thousand dollars, but once you've sold 50 coins for 20 or 50 bucks a piece, it's really easy to justify a couple hundred bucks on a piece of equipment. Um, the other thing after, you know, after that, you're pushing with hand tools and your hands get tired, you get one of these guys. And uh, it's just basically turns your little hand graver into like a magic hand graver that it vibrates and the metal just jumps away instead of pushing with muscle the tool does all the work um a lot of people give me crap they go that's not you're not you're using a machine that's not hand carving hobos didn't have that and i go well you know hobos didn't necessarily carry this stuff but a smart hobo would have found it if he found it at a garage sale like I did uh, for, for a third of the price you would have had to pay. But the other thing I like to say is um, it's a nice machine, but carve. I, I, it won't carve itself. Your hands are still involved. I, it's a lot of nice stuff and it makes it easier, but your eyes are connected to your brain and your brain's connected to your hand and the hand is what's holding the machine so technically it is machine engraving but it's hand machine engraving and i don't lose any sleep over it <laughs> so um if you don't want to buy my coins because i didn't carve them under a bridge i apologize <laughs> but i have carved coins under a bridge so <laughs> um, but yeah, that, there is this whole thing like, well, hobos didn't do that. And, and uh, the other thing about that is that um, uh, we know some hobos carved hobo nickels, but not all hobo nickels were carved by, you know, union card carrying hobos. So, um, you know, if it's a pretty coin and you like it and it looks cool, who cares who carved it or how? So that's the way I look at that. Um, I think... Uh, beyond that, I can sit down and show you some stuff. That's always fun. Um, How do you, yeah. So you got to use the uh, buffalo nickel to do this, right? No, uh, that's a good question, and it, it's actually one that gets asked often. Um, you can carve any coin. Uh, the, the things when you, when you're working with metal, the one rule you always have to follow, no matter what, whether you're a machinist or a hobbyist or whatever. 
the metal you're carving has to be softer than the metal you're carving it with. So uh, these tools were invented and designed to carve in steel. They're, they're uh, for die carvers or, or metal workers or, uh, um, you know, so if you're going to uh, be uh, carving coining dies, this is what you use. And this is hardened steel and you're going to be carving into uh, not harden steel and then when you're done you harden it and then stamp your coins so um, this will carve almost any steel you can throw at it but the nickel is, is significantly softer uh, it is harder than any other coin metal copper is soft silver is soft gold is soft uh, the nickel copper blend is is pretty hard relatively speaking but compared to steel it, it's it's butter which um i'll show you here yeah, the, reason, the reason i asked you that it seemed like it'd be hard to find those buffalo nipples well they they minted a few billion a year from 1913 to 38 so that that was another thing i got this nasty email one time and i said I don't know why anybody would collect that crap. You're, you're ruining history. You're defacing historical coins. And I said, well, man, I pick them up about a quarter a piece down at the coin shop out of their junk bucket. And, uh, you know, if you look up those mintages, uh, 12 and a half billion for 1937, I don't think I'm like making much of a dent on history, you know, and some people really. How many billion have you done so far? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm denting in. Yeah, the first 300 coins went slow, but the next billion went. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, people really, and, and I, I've had people comment, um, the, the big money hobo nickel collectors, you know, the, the guys who are buying modern pieces uh, for a thousand, two thousand dollars uh, and up, they, they want the nicest host coin possible. So it's not uncommon for a, a good artist to spend 50 or a hundred dollars on the coin before he even carves it. But you know, when you're selling them for 4,000, 5,000 bucks, you know, who cares? So at this point, uh, I don't even carve low grade coins. They just, you know, I don't have time to do it. Uh, I'll buy mostly uh, XF and better 36, 37s. Uh, I'm carving a, it's probably um, AU uh, 1913 type one that's got real nice eye appeal. I'm carving that. Uh, um, it's kind of the guy who, is ordering it sent me a coin he wanted me to carve and it's ms65 1913 type one with uh orange green toning i mean it's just it's a piece of art as it is and i i stared at it for a month going he wants me to cut this what is this crazy and finally i brought the coin here had uh, uh, Doug take a look, a few of the guys here take a look, and just said, I need you guys to tell me that I'm not allowed to carve this coin. <laughs> like, just tell me that it would be a bad thing. And, and he, they said, yeah, this is nice. So I went to, to my customer and said, look, I can find a similar coin. Let me find a scratched coin. Let me find one that you won't tell the difference. So uh, I found a similar coin for $15 that, you know, but he wanted me to He's paying me five hundred dollars to carve a coin that's already worth a thousand. I'm like, you're, you're, this is a losing proposition, dude. You know, you're not going to get your money back. But, um, but you know, but that's the testament of a hobo nickel. Is it's an emotional purchase. It's it's different than all the other coins in your collection. And uh, I interviewed a, a guy, one of my good customers. Uh, is from Seattle. His name's Mike Dunmire, and he owns the nicest collection of uh, 50 cent uh, Benjamin Franklin's in the world. Nicer than the Smithsonian's collection. He's said everybody in the world wants it and he goes, I own the nicest collection of 50 cent pieces in the world and they all look the freaking same. You know, like he's like, he spent 20 years and countless, I don't know how many millions putting this collection together, but his hobos give him more joy because he can show them to people and and you know i go oh here's a hobo nickel you don't know what you're going to look at it could be anything in the world when you look at that hobo nickel and you, you think oh it might be a guy with a hat and a beard and then you look and it it could be a guy taking a crap 
you don't know, you know, so it's that mystery, that excitement, and uh, and you get excited, you either love it or you don't, and so once you're a collector, you see a coin you love, and, and um, it's taken up rent in the back of your head until you own it, and you don't know, just, oh God, I should have bought that coin when I had the chance, and it just, it, it can be pretty bad. It's, it's much different than any other, um, well, not much different. Coins, coins is emotion, no matter what. You know, how can how, how else can you justify spending thousands of dollars on a penny? You know, oh, but I really like this penny. It's better than the other pennies. But um, with hobo nickels, uh, it's it's more obvious why you love it or not because you either do or you don't. So. Um. You can, yeah. You can uh, just take a take a any coin out of your pocket right now and. Uh, start hammering it scratch it you know uh, there's a neat tool it's called a scribe which is just a really really sharp piece of steel or uh, carbide or it'll have a diamond on the tip and um, you can get one at most art supply stores for about five or six bucks if you take that and take uh, any modern copper penny anything after 1982 which is actually a zinc penny but you can draw these lines and the copper just scratches right off and there's a nice silver layer underneath so for kids especially around your age uh, have your folks help you hot glue some pennies onto a 2 by 4 and just draw on them like you're sketching with a marker and that copper will disappear. You can give them a mohawk like a punk rocker, give them a football helmet, give them a space helmet, give them a big curly mustache, make them, uh, you know, there's nothing uh, you can't do. You can write people's names and, um, and uh, you do that for a little while and you'll get the hang of it and you'll realize, oh, hey, if I push a little harder, I can scratch and you, you do that for a little while you'll be carving masterpieces in a year I guarantee it so and yeah just because it's a penny doesn't mean it's not still a hobo nickel it's an, any coin that you take and change you know if, if the picture on the coin is different when you're done you, you did it right so it's awesome huh you don't have to buy paint you don't have to stretch a canvas you don't get your hands all messy with clay and grit it's uh it's pretty much the perfect art form so um does anybody have any questions before i do a little carving up on the screen back when i was a kid back in the 50s my dad I, we lived on a farm and he would save the buffalo nickels he knew I'd get 50 cents a week allowance. Okay. And he would say, he knew if I, he gave me regular change, I'd be off to the candy store or whatever. Right, mm -hmm. right. And I like Buffalo Nickel so Okay. Save them out of change. Yeah. And I, I ended up having jars of them. Oh, that's I'm awesome. Now, like, now, I think. <laughs> oh, geez. But uh, every once in a while, I'd get one like that. It would like a, a nickel, you know, and they, somebody put a beard on it. Those are. And then they put us like a cigar. Smoke see, cigar those are, those are them. really and valuable like, coins. So the old hobos did that during Depression, but I never. That's awesome. Yeah, anybody, that's... I mean, anybody could have done it. Well, that's it, you know. Um, by... Really, the, the story that I... How I understand it, and, and there's significant debate and, and confusion, but um, the term hobo nickel wasn't really widely used. It wasn't even published until the 1970s. In the late 70s, Del Romine started writing a series of articles for Coin World magazine, and uh, I believe that's the first published use of the word hobo nickel. Uh, in 1982, he put out a book, I think it was 82, 81 or 82, he put out a book uh, called uh, Prison Hobo nickels, prisoner nickels, and other altered coins. Uh, the first printed proof of the hobo nickel existing uh, was in 1917. Uh, the sheriff of Albany, New York, placed an ad to offering a reward for whoever was uh, turning the Indian into the Kaiser. So uh, they put a pointed helmet and a curly mustache. And um, what uh, what I've heard is that, that uh, a lot of uh, U.S. soldiers getting shipped to the European theater in World War I would all get shipped out of Hoboken, New Jersey, and in their downtime, they would alter nickels and then pass them off in the bars as a prank, you know, like slide it as a, a, a payment up, you know, face down and then bail real quick. And uh, the bartenders would 
have jars of these worthless nickels, you know, at the time worthless nickels, uh, on next to the register. And when party boys from New York who would come over to party, they'd slip the nickels back in their change to get rid of them. And so there's just this, this series of pranks going back and forth. Uh, yeah? Is an altered coin legal tender? It is, yes. Any, any coin minted by the United States Mint, no matter how messed up, can still be spent as legal tender. So uh, I would question your intelligence well, right, if you sold a $200 hobo nickel or went and bought a bubble gum. But them, so they them well, well, at the time, you know, people took things much different. Now, you know, nobody cares. It's a nickel. You know, they have the coin rolling machines. And there, there are uh, technicalities and loopholes that make it, you know, maybe technically illegal, but not really criminal. Nobody would really care. Um, in 1913, a nickel was a good 10, 15, 20 dollars. You know, you could buy uh, a clean, nice shirt. You could buy a night in a hotel. You could get a full meal with a cup of coffee at the end with it for a nickel. You know, that was a, a decent amount of money. Um, so uh, by the Great Depression, a nickel wasn't worth quite as much. And so that whole story of people carving a nickel to trade it for a meal or for, for a favorable treatment with, with a railroad bowl or something, uh, by the 30s, a nickel might have been a buck and it wasn't as big of a deal to sit and carve it. So some of these uh, 1913 hobo nickels uh, that are really well carved and beautiful pieces, uh, you'll see tools and techniques that, that really lent themselves more to a jeweler or a, an engraver, a professional engraver than a hobo on the street. The, the crude ones now that you find, you know, you find a no-date buffalo nickel that's been messed up in any way, well, you know, what's the risk of finding a no-date buffalo nickel and carving it? You know, I, I could buy in bulk maybe eight cents a piece. You know, if I want a thousand no-day buffalo nickels, you can get them really cheap. Um, which is why I, I suggest anybody who's interested in collecting hobo nickels uh, approach every transaction with a skeptical eye. Uh, don't believe the seller, uh, unless it's the carver. I can say if, if you're buying modern carvers, carvings from the carver, you, you can pretty much trust that you're getting what you, you, you expect. But um, it would be very easy to misrepresent 90% of the carvings in my collection as either original hobo nickels or um, more significant for one reason or another. Uh, but but yeah, the no date, you know, my kids, I, I've got in here a, a good pile of really crude, I'll pass a couple of these out. There's three going around. All of these were carved by children under the age of 13. Uh, I just left them in my toolkit. I forgot I had a little Q-tip with some hydrochloric acid that it let, stayed in there. So a handful of all these nickels turned real weird and green and corroded. And there were two of those carvings I put in flips because I liked them so much. If I would have found them at a coin show, I'd have paid 75 or 100 bucks because it looks crude, old, messed up, really neat. My kids made them. So keep that in the back of your head. Uh, there are also guys, you know, like me, uh, I could carve this, this coin in 15 or 20 minutes. If I don't sign it, there is absolutely no way to identify who carved it. You know, people say, oh, you could get under the microscope with, you know, forensic scientist tools and, you know, line up the scratch marks. And I go, yeah, but I sharpen my tools every two weeks. So, you know, you can't, it's not like a bullet out of a gun where everyone has the same lines. And so uh, the opportunity for fraud with hobo nickels is huge. Um, and there are a couple of carvers, I won't uh, mention them by name, um, that they unapologetically carve original looking hobo nickels and don't sign them. They sell them as their own pieces, but the minute it leaves their hand, whoever bought it can do whatever they want. And I know I've seen it before. I've been walking the, the burst floor and you see a nice tray of hobo nickels and the guy goes, oh yeah, those are nice, original, unknown carvers. 
I, you know, you, you know, you, you can take his word for it that he doesn't know who carved him, or and, you know, just because you don't know who carved him doesn't mean nobody knows. And uh, th there's a, a couple of guys, a guy, one guy out of Chicago, his coins are beautiful. They are fantastic. They look real. They look legit. And he does not sign them. And you can write him and say, I want three that look like Bert coins. I want three that look like peanut ear. And I want this. And you put them in your case. And you go, unknown hobo nickel. And some guy walks up and goes, that looks like a peanut ear. And you go, I don't know who peanut ear is. And they go, oh, that, that's worth a thousand bucks. And you go, well, I only want 500 for this one. So be very careful. Don't let your emotions get the better of you. And, uh, you know, buyer beware a thousand times. Buy the coin because you like the carving, not because somebody told you this guy did it or it's worth this amount of money. Uh, you really have to follow your gut and make sure that you're going to want that coin even if you find out it was a fake. In fact, a great story, Don Haley, um, who is featured in this little movie clip that I'll play for whoever has time, he bought a beautiful old coin in a nice plastic holder and got super excited and owned it for years and was showing it off and some guy goes, I got that exact coin and you do with a hobo nickel, that's just not possible. He goes, I swear I have that coin. So they popped it out of the holder and sure enough, it was a casting. And, you know, he paid 800 bucks or so for this cast, you know, and uh, the dealer he bought it from found out, apologized up and down. I didn't know, I didn't know. And Don said, I'm not giving you this coin back. I'm keeping it. I like it. And this is a good lesson for me to remember. So he tells everybody, you know, double, double check. And uh, it's a popular slogan and people don't take it seriously, especially in the coin, uh, you know, amateur coin collectors. Uh, two things to, to always remember. Buy the book before you buy the coin. <laughs> Read it a thousand times. Make sure you understand it. Don't get excited just because you think, you know, if it's too good to be true, it's going to be. Um, and, uh, oh, what was the other thing? <laughs> Come on, hon, give it to me. <laughs> You've heard my speech a thousand times. Um, buyer beware. Don't do this. Don't do that. Well, I lost my train of thought. I mean, I could just see some. Uh, police officer, you're defacing public property. Yeah, government property. I'm <laughs> dying. I've been dying to get arrested for this. I've just like I would be like the proudest th th moment for me. Um, yeah, yeah. No, uh, there, there are two schools of thought. One, uh, the the title of U.S. code that makes it uh, seem illegal is is this big scary worded thing that says. It is a felony to uh, uh, deface, manipulate, lighten, alter, um, mutilate. Uh, you know, there's a million different words. Uh, any any coin of the United States mint or any legal tender or, or coinage that is used as money in the United States. And uh, at the very beginning of the sentence is a beautiful word that I just love. It says fraudulently. It, sh it is illegal to fraudulently manipulate, lighten, alter, deface, uh, which means basically if, if you're just doing it for fun, just to keep yourself entertained and you're not going to try and go tell somebody that, oh, this nickel is a rare 1936D or 37D three-legged buffalo, you're good. If, if you're not going to present that as something that it isn't, I think you're, you're perfectly in within the, the law. Uh, that's the same law that makes it legal to roll pennies in the penny press, like out in the lobby, because you're essentially, yeah, you're, you're defacing that coin. Um, the other thing which just kind of happened recently, which kind of throws it all into turmoil, is uh, a few years back, Congress passed a law that says it's illegal to remove small denomination coins, nickels and pennies from circulation. So uh, basically what was happening was the metal value of pennies and nickels exceeded the face value. And so, um, you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out, well, if a nickel's worth six cents in raw metal, I'm gonna buy a bunch of nickels and melt them down for raw metal. So they had to pass a law that says it's illegal to do that. Um, I still know a few people who are hoarding massive amounts of copper pennies and, and nickels. 
uh, because they know that that law is only good for circulating coinage. And as we've all known, you can't go two weeks without somebody going, we got to get rid of the penny. We got to get rid of the nickel or change the, the, the metal or we're losing money. So uh, Canada did it. Ireland is next. They're getting rid of their pennies and two cent pieces. And it's just a matter of time until uh, the U.S. realizes, you know, the same same reason. We don't have a half penny anymore, but we used to. We don't really need to count our pennies, and uh, so as soon as those pennies are gone, uh, you can melt them, you can smash them, you can do whatever you want. So I think uh, technically it's legal, technically again it's illegal, and uh, I would love to be the poster boy for the courts to figure it out, because that'd just be too much fun, you know. And then he carved this with a little guy on the toilet, you know, and this one he carved, <laughs> so... Um, any other questions before I just kind of carve and talk about what I'm doing while I'm carving? Isn't one of the big weaknesses of that buffalo nickel's design that the date is the first thing to wear off? Well, uh, that's where you get the Type 1, Type 2. In 1913, the original Type 1 nickel, uh, underneath the, the buffalo, the five cents where it said five cents was sitting on a mound and the letters were raised above the mound and that uh, coincidentally became the highest point on the coin so when they rubbed together in your pockets the denomination would rub right off so pretty quickly they realized that and then they they lowered the five cents to a recess so it's underneath the mound and then the, the mound is removed away uh, current you know, then they left that similar relief through the rest of the the minting till 1938 but uh the high points of the coin where it wears first are going to be on the indian's cheekbone uh, and then on the back the horn of the indian are the first things to rub off uh, of a uh, type two and more recent the type one you find uh, you can find them all the time in uh, bags of no date buffalo nickels you just look for the one instead of saying five cents it's flat and smooth at the bottom and you know that was a 1913 type one no date and you know it's marginally more valuable than any of the other no dates you know it might be worth a quarter instead of 15 cents but uh that that's why they had to change the design so um but yeah no the dates do wear off and the liberty wears off but it takes it takes quite a bit of circulation uh, and you can still find plenty of good nickels with the dates intact so but um not quite as big a screw up as the uh 1883 v nickel that when they first minted it they they put the five cents in Roman numerals, so it just says V, but they forgot to put cents or dollars. So people would gold plate them and pass them off to anybody who couldn't read or wasn't, you know, super savvy. Go pass it to an immigrant fresh off the boat, and they go, oh, a gold five dollar, and it's just a gold plated nickel. So yeah, uh, those are called racketeer nickels. Uh, 1883 gold plated uh, but it, it says five but it doesn't say cents so that's uh, pretty pretty dirty trick <laughs> where do you get t-shirts uh you, you have to steal them from me apparently <laughs> yeah uh you can order them online but um I, I don't get paid until my lawsuit goes through so um yeah i carved a little crude skeleton a few years back and a, a year later it popped up on a few different clothing lines and so um, I got I got my shirt and hat but uh, it's cost quite a bit of money to, to <laughs> try and get to the bottom of it so but yeah so basically um, this setup here is uh, not the most sophisticated, but it, this is kind of the, the NASA circa Apollo mission setup. Uh, we, we have fancier stuff that's been invented since, but this, this can get me all the way to the moon if I need to. Um, the Graver Smith, basically all this does is it, it turns this hand tool, this is called a graver, uh, same exact thing, but it, it shoots air through it so it vibrates at the top and uh, that just 
kind of creates a magic wand not not really you know it still takes skill but instead of me having to force my way through the metal it just kind of jumps out of the way for me um, and it's just controlled with uh, pressurized air I've got a little tiny um, air compressor down here and it regulates it and then I have like a little gas pump like a tattoo gun and uh, what I if you follow along up here uh, what I've done so far is I chopped off his, his braid, I uh, chopped off his feathers, and I kind of gave him a rough hat, a rough ear, and I'm just starting to move the metal away. And, and this is kind of just the rough out sculpting phase before I go in, polish it, and then add all the detail stuff. But um, the stereo microscope is awesome it, it's uh, the stereo means that your image is going to be 3d so you can actually see what you're doing and uh, let's see if I can push some metal around for you guys you like to carve around the ear so it looks a little taller than the rest of the background There's really only so much you can do at each stage and uh, the power is awesome because if you want to move a lot of metal fast, it just makes it easy. But I still do at least 80 or 90% of the carving without running the power. And when it's not running, your tactile senses really kick in and you can just feel how much metal you're scraping. And it's really a, a meditative and calm process, but like, in this background, I'll just kind of just scrape away lightly until I get that level plane down. Um, and then once once the bulk of it is level, I can take these little tiny, um, they're little sticks of, of abrasive, like basically a sandpaper stick. And uh, you go in and that, that'll just polish and smooth and help you get a consistent texture and toning so um, each different little tool will have a little tip and there's flat gravers round gravers onglong and uh, which are like teardrop um, I just recently learned that this big fat thick one is super super awesome for removing just about everything and uh, I kept hooking a corner. I'd like carve, it'd be super smooth and I'd be almost done. And then I'd twist and I'd hook a corner and have a big gouge and have to level everything down. So uh, Ron Landis goes, hey, yeah, you know, if you curve that to match the, uh, the curve of the nickel, see how that's curved. So now I just scoop right around and it, it leaves everything all beautiful and those corners don't hook and catch. So that's something that, you know, in 30 seconds of advice from another carver saved me a year of trial and error and screwing up coins and going back and fixing them. So, so how long have you been doing this? Um, I carved my first hobo nickel, which is down at the very end on the far row, the top four. I carved those uh, right around Thanksgiving of 2008. So uh, not quite five full years. The first year went really slow. Just uh, I would carved with a sharpened ice pick for a while till I figured out that uh, these were what you're supposed to use. A buddy of mine goes, you know, I got a graver. I go, what's that? And he's like, well, that's what people actually are supposed to engrave with. Like, oh, is that what I'm doing, engraving? Okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, it took a while. And then um, in uh, 2011, January 2011, I took a hitchhiking trip to Florida to go to the fun show, the Florida Universal Numismatist Show. And that's where the Hobo Nickel Convention, or Hobo Nickel Society has their annual convention. And uh, as you'll see, I'm going to play a little video, uh, you know, a teaser of the film I'm making. So while I'm on the road, I was carving with a stick and one or two little gravers and everything I had was in this uh, pencil box in my backpack. And uh, when I got to Florida, I met 
eight other guys who actually knew what they were doing. I got a jeweler's ball. They told me about all this crazy stuff and it just really opened up the whole world for me. Um, and yeah, and, and now, you know, in 2008, uh, Hobo Nickel Society had a website up and there was a little bit of information and, and uh, a few people out there, uh, Vern Walrefren was, was the secretary of the club and he encouraged me a lot, told me all the things that I was doing wrong and got me started. Uh, but now the website has expanded, there are eight or ten guys who are filming YouTube videos and posting all these tutorials and there's uh, live chat sessions on uh, engraverforum.com where guys will have cameras like this hooked up to the internet and you can watch them while they're carving and um, there's no excuse to not be able to figure out how to do it on your own. Uh, a buddy of mine, Paolo, lives in Spain and bought a roll of buffalo nickels off of ebay and taught himself how to carve hobo nickels and his stuff makes mine look like a, a one-armed blind man was carving on a freight train in the dark you know so um he, he's just an amazing talented engraver and uh, he's self-taught and has no access to any of the tools or things that we have in the states but but you don't need that you know the internet just turned it into this global fine art movement that really a couple years ago it was still just a, a kind of cute little numismatic freak show on the side and um, it's kind of stepping up to, to hold its own. So.